here we go. Thank you. So it's really a great pleasure for me both to thank Erica Holzbauer uh, for participating today and uh, to introduce her, although that's hardly necessary. She's a professor of physiology and biophysics at the University of Pennsylvania. She's uh, received uh, multiple awards over the years, including uh, Javits Neuroscience Investigator Award for her stellar work in understanding the molecular mechanisms whereby both molecules and subcellular components get moved around in the cell, including, of course, studying the process of axonal transport. And it's fair to say, I think, Erica, that your work has really illuminated the pathobiology of those processes, and in particular, the way that mutant ALS genes have an adverse impact not only uh, on those processes in neurons, but also in non-neuronal cells leading to such phenomena as uh, neuroinflammation. So uh, we really appreciate uh, your, your making time to be with us today and look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks so much for that very generous uh, introduction. And I will share my slides and hopefully that's good for everyone. Looks good. Great. All right. So it's a pleasure to be here um, and take part in this important day thinking about ALS and um, both the pathobiology and then obviously uh, approaches to therapeutics. So my own interest is squarely in the basic, the basic research. So broadly speaking, my lab is interested in the mechanisms that keep neurons alive and functioning. So neurons are particularly interesting cells because they're highly differentiated cells, highly polarized cells. So as you just heard, a lot of the work in my lab focuses on transport, especially transport along the axon. This transport involves the tra um, trafficking of newly synthesized material from the soma where it's made out to the axon tip and the neuromuscular junction and also the reverse process of removing um, aggregated proteins or dysfunctional organelles from the distal end of the axon back to the soma for degradation. This all seems fairly simple in this type of cartoon of a neuron I've shown here, but what we have to remember is the real scale of the problem. So what is uh, drawn here is a human motor neuron drawn to scale. This little red dot up here is the uh, soma or cell body, which is the primary site of, of biosynthesis of new proteins, lipids, uh, RNAs. Um, and down here is neuromuscular junction, the business end where this neuron is going to actually contact the muscles uh, that it's innervating. So you have to have active transport along this length, which can be up to a meter or more in uh, humans. So the other part of the problem that makes it really challenging is you don't need to just do this for a little while. We have to keep these cells alive for a uh, hundred years, hopefully. For, uh, so we're very interested in how this active transport happens. It's driven by molecular motors along the cellular side of skeleton. And we know uh, over the years that direct mutations in the motors or the tracks can lead to ALS. But today I'm gonna talk about a slightly different aspect of our work, which is how you take out the garbage, how you clear the trash from a neuron. And this is particularly the process of autophagy. So just so everybody's on the same page, autophagy is a highly conserved cellular process in which you remove aggregated proteins or dysfunctional organelles from mammalian cells or even yeast cells, it's that conserved. What happens in autophagy is you get the formation of a double membrane that surrounds the material that's going to be removed. That uh, seals off, it looks like a, a donut in this uh, schematic, but actually imagine that it's fully encapsulated by a sphere. And that then seals these damaging components from the cellular cytosol. So at least it's separated. So basically it's putting your trash within a bag. But that doesn't actually degrade uh, the trash. For that to happen, this autophagosome has to fuse with the lysosome. So lysosomes are the primary degradative organelles in the cell that have the degradative enzymes that are tightly uh, regulated primarily by pH to uh, specifically degrade these captured cargoes. Once this fusion occurs, you get the eventual degradation of these enclosed contents and uh, the release of the constituent parts for recycling and reuse by the cell. 
So we know that autophagy is critical for neuronal health because if you deplete uh, autophagy specific genes, that's enough to induce neurodegeneration. We also know from decades of pathology that autophagy is misregulated in neurodegenerative diseases. Today, we're talking about ALS, but you can also see, see evidence in Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and Parkinson's. And further, genetics is telling us this pathway is likely to be very important because we know that mutations in genes uh, that are required for a particular kind of autophagy called mitophagy, which is the removal of damaged mitochondria, are directly implicated in both ALS and Parkinson's. So uh, with that as an introduction, I wanna show you what autophagy actually looks like in a neuron. So what you're seeing here is a dorsal root ganglion neuron uh, from a mouse dissected and imaged in culture. What this uh, neuron is expressing is a fluorescent construct that is targeted specifically to the autophagosomes that I'm telling you about. So before this movie even plays, you can see a fully formed autophagosome here with what looks like a donut in this uh, donut morphology in this confocal section. But um, what, you'll, what you can imagine is that if you saw the full 3D reconstruction, it would be a sphere. As the movie plays, what you're going to see is a little bouncing around of this fully formed autophagosome, but also you'll see starting right now, the formation of a, another new autophagosome. So what my lab discovered when we started imaging this process in a dish is that neurons in culture, and we now know neurons in vivo, continuously generate new autophagosomes in the distal axon and at synaptic sites. It's a very specific and very continuous uh, process of basal autophagy in these neurons. Once these autophagosomes are generated, they quickly bind to the microtubule cytoskeleton, uh, which is shown here in red. So you can see the long filamentous microtubules and you can see these uh, green autophagosomes bound to the microtubules. Once they bind to these microtubules, what you'll see is rapid movement of these autophagosomes back to the soma. So the uh, autophagosomes, when they form, take up their cargo. And what we're finding is that these cargos are specifically um, engulfed and then transported back to the soma with the degradation of these cargos starting in root and then finishing in the soma. So from our work and those of many other labs in both uh, neurons in vitro, as well as uh, in and intact organisms where we can uh, look at autophagy in, in vivo, such as Drosophila, zebrafish, and C. elegans, we know that there is a conserved pathway for basal autophagy in neurons in which you get the generation of these organelles and the uptake of their cargos as they form and you get this fusion with the lysosome to make it a fully degradative compartment and then trafficking back to the cell body via the motors that uh, we've been talking about. We also know that this transport is tightly linked to the maturation of this organelle. If you disrupt transport, what you do is disrupt the maturation and the ability of this organelle to actually degrade its enclosed cargos. So these processes are tightly linked and um, in different diseases now we're finding clear evidence that trafficking is disrupted and that leads to a disruption of and the dis uh, disrupted degradation of the enclosed contents. So that was really interesting for us. And we spent a lot of time and work that I'm not gonna tell you about, thinking about the motors that are driving this process, how they're regulated and what it means for the maturation and the function of the autophagosome. But what I wanna to spend today talking about is the cargos that are engulfed by this autophagic process. There's been a lot of suggestions over the years of specific different cargos that could be degraded by autophagy and their possible importance to this cell. But what we wanted to know was exactly what is the range of cargos and what are the most important cargos that are turned over by autophagy in neurons and more generally in the brain. So basically what cargos are engulfed in this process. So to do this, a, a brilliant postdoc in my lab, Juliet Goldsmith, set out to ask what are the cargos degraded by autophagy in the mouse brain? So she took uh, mid-adult uh, mouse brains, uh, made homogenates, and then isolated the autophagosomes through a series of differential centrifugation steps. 
none of which involved any specific reg recognition of uh, the autophagous zone. We wanted to isolate by size and density so we could get the full spectrum of autophagic vesicles from the brain. Once we got these autophagic vesicles, she then divided her preparation into three separate fractions. The first, we uh, performed proteomic analysis on as is. The second, we first treated with proteinase K. What proteinase K is gonna do is cleave off and degrade all the proteins associated with the outer membrane of the autophagosome. What this will do is then enrich for the proteins that are engulfed within the autophagosome, the cargo and the uh, cargo to be degraded of these organelles. And then the third fraction was our control where we first permeabilized the membrane with Triton X and then added the proteinase K. Under, and so under these conditions, we would degrade not just the external proteins, but also the internal cargo. And as you'll see again and again on, on the gels and blots I'm showing you, that was um, uh, very effective as a, as a negative control for these experiments. So once we had these preparations, we could show that they were enriched in our markers for auto, autophagic vesicles, LC3, especially the lipidated form of LC3, which is LC32. We could then uh, send these to uh, mass spec analysis uh, by Wade Harper and all then Orderu, and then analyze the results. What we saw was uh, really quite clear. The, uh, one of the two major cargos for autophagosomes in the brain, in mouse, under basal conditions, is mitochondria. And that's very clear if you look at this image of one of the autophagosomes we isolated and analyzed by EM. What you can see is clear evidence of mitochondrial fragments. The other major cargo that we saw uh, in this analysis that I won't be really talking about today is synaptic vesicles. And you can also see evidence for these within this uh, uh, autophagic vesicle that I'm showing you here. But specifically, we're really interested in the role of autophagy and turning over mitochondria in neurons. So we saw when we analyzed it, uh, we saw evidence that just about every type, every uh, part of the mitochondria was enriched uh, within these autophagosomes, but remarkably not evenly. So we saw evidence for uh, uptake of in the autophagosome of mitochondrial matrix or uh, inner membrane proteins or outer membrane proteins, and they were all there. But the one fraction that was uh, showed an elevated uh, engulfment within these autophagosomes was uh, proteins associated directly with mitochondrial DNA. And we did not at all expect this. Um, here are some of the specific examples of things that we saw enriched in our fraction. I'm going to focus a lot today on TFAM, which is a protein that's known to be associated specifically with the mitochondrial genome within the mitochondria. But we also saw evidence for other mitochondrial DNA associated proteins, such as POLG2 and Twinkle. So overall, our uh, proteomic analysis has supported this unexpected enrichment of mitochondrial nucleoids and their associated proteins uh, with this fraction of autophagic vesicles. To verify these proteomics, we pr took our fractions from our uh, preparation and blotted them for that mitochondrial associated pro DNA associated protein I told you about called TFAM. And as you can see here, we saw a strong enrichment in the autophagic vesicle fraction, e striking even when you compare it to a mitochondrial enriched fraction, telling us just how concentrated this protein was within our autophagic vesicles. And we could show that it was in the cargo fraction because it has remained in this fraction that had been treated to degrade external proteins with proteinase K. So we knew that it was a membrane protected protein within these autophagic vesicles. So these uh, data are when we're looking at a fraction that's isolated from the whole brain. But I told you what we were really interested in was uh, what was the role of autophagy in neurons. So we next used um, uh, I3 or IPSC derived neurons to ask if we isolate enough neurons and do a similar autophagosome 
preparation from those neurons? Will we also see an enrichment of mitochondrial markers in general and TFAM in particular? And as you can see from the blot I'm showing and the quantitation over here, we do indeed see an enrichment of TFAM in autophagic vesicles isolated directly from these uh, human uh, induced neurons. Further, I showed you at the beginning that we could monitor the trafficking of autophagosomes along the axon. So we looked to see if we could see TFAM as a component, a cargo that would co-traffic with those autophagosomes labeled with LC3. So what I'm showing you here is not a movie, but it's what's called a chymograph, where we take a, a region of interest along the axon from each uh, panel of the movie, each uh, time point of the movie, and lay them um, uh, along each other so that time is increasing uh, as we move down the y-axis here. So under this circumstance, anything that doesn't move over time will be a vertical line, and anything that does move uh, over time will be a diagonal line. So what we can see here uh, in this basically two-dimensional representation of our movies is that we see these potent movement of this um, LC3 positive autophagosomes. And if you look, what you see is uh, coincident with that movement in our uh, alternative uh, fluorescent channel is we see TFAM is engulfed within these autophagosomes and is moving along with them. And uh, this is maybe a little bit more clear in these cartoons we've driven under here. So if we quantitate all this, we find that 40% of the autophagosomes that are moving along the axon of these neurons have TFAM, which again is enriched if we compare it even to a general mitochondrial marker. So these data are telling us that um, there's a high uptake of uh, mitochondrial nucleoids within uh, autophagosomes in neurons. Well, if we have uh, proteins that are associated with mitochondrial DNA, the obvious question is, do we see any evidence for mitochondrial DNA within these autophagosomes? So to we tested that possibility in two ways. The first is we took our isolated autophagosomes and spread them out on a cover slip. We then stained with uh, dyes that would specifically uh, react to the membrane and to uh, DNA. And what we could see is the clear coincidence of DNA with these autophagosomes. And that's quantitated here, which almost exactly correlates with the extent of autophagosomes that had mitochondrial DNA associated proteins that we saw moving along the axon. That tells us that we have, we have DNA in them, but to specifically know whether we have mitochondrial DNA, we turn to uh, qPCR. And here we look for uh, markers of either nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA. And what you can clearly see is that we're getting no co-purification of nuclear DNA with these autophagosomes, but we're getting clear uh, co-purification of mitochondrial DNA. So, uh, combined with the data that I don't have time to tell you about, our model now is that when these autophagosomes are generated, they're generated specifically at contact sites between uh, ER and mitochondria. And there's a specific fission event of the mitochondria by the enzyme DRP1 that results in a nucleoid enriched mitochondrial fragment. Our hypothesis is that these nucleoid enriched fragments are generated immediately in the region where the new autophagosome is forming. It forms from a structure called an omegasome. So you get the formation of these nucleoid enriched fractions exactly where these new autophagosomes are forming. And I showed you the live cell of them forming. And this allows a very efficient uh, capture of uh, mitochondrial DNA at basal levels. So why do we think this is so important? Well, a growing stream of evidence, and I'll talk a bit more about this in the second part of my talk, but a growing stream of evidence is telling us that the exposure of mitochondrial DNA to the cytosol of a cell is dangerous. In many cells, this type of exposure is enough to set off stress pathways, such as the uh, C-gas sting pathway that lead directly to inflammation. <clears throat> 
So our hypothesis right now is that one of the roles, the major roles of basal autophagy in neurons is to effectively clear mitochondrial DNA so that it doesn't build up in the neuron or it doesn't get released to the surrounding glia. And that if you do either one of those uh, things, you don't effectively capture it and you, it builds up in the neuron or in the surrounding glia, that has the potential to lead to neuroinflammation and that in turn could lead to axon degeneration. So to follow up on that possibility, I just want to tell you that everything I've been telling you about so far has to do with basal autophagy which uh, we believe is a homeostatic mechanism that happens continuously in neurons to maintain neuronal health. However, autophagy is also well known to occur as a stress-induced pathway. And in particular, there's clear evidence for stress-induced removal of either damaged mitochondria or other organelles such as damaged lysosomes in a very targeted and specific way. And our hypothesis is that these both of these pathways are required to maintain a healthy neuron. So in terms of stress-induced autophagy, the best characterized is pink one park independent mitophagy. As the name suggests, this is a very specific pathway to remove damaged mitochondria. It's uh, been elegantly worked out uh, primarily by Richard Ewell, but many other labs have contributed. And in this pathway, we know that there's two specific players, an enzyme called PINK1, which is a, a kinase that is normally kept at very low levels on the surface of the mitochondria. It's, it's effectively imported and degraded. But when uh, the mitochondria becomes depolarized, PINK1 will accumulate on the surface of mitochondria. That pink one has two different targets. The first is ubiquinin, which it'll phosphorylate. And the second is an enzyme called parkin, which will also phosphorylate. Parkin is an E3 ubiquitin ligase. So once parkin is phosphorylated, it becomes active and begins to set up more ubiquinins on the surface of this mitochondria that rapidly become uh, phosphorylated. And this all sets up a very effective feed forward mechanism that rapidly surrounds the damaged mitochondria with a shell of uh, ubiquitin and phosphoubiquitin. This phosphoubiquitin is then known to recruit specific receptors that will signal for the recognition of this damaged mitochondria by the uh, components that build an autophagosome and it allow the engulfment and removal specifically of these damaged mitochondria. So our interest in mitophagy started right there. Um, at the point where the uh, receptors that were involved in recognizing damaged mitochondria had not yet uh, been identified. There was a family of proteins that had interesting domains that would be predict predicted to be uh, necessary for this process. They, uh, all members of this family could bind ubiquitin and they could also bind LC3, that protein that's enriched on the membrane of developing autophagosomes. There's a lot of interest in P62, and that was at, the point, at that time thought to perhaps be the major receptor for damaged mitochondria. Uh, but our interest focused primarily on the protein optineurin. And the reason is just when we started working on this, optineurin had been discovered to be an ALS-linked gene. We had the idea that the turnover of damaged mitochondria might be a part of the uh, mechanism leading to ALS, in, at least in some patients. And this identity of optineurin as both an ALS-linked gene and a putative mitophagy receptor was enough to set us on the path to uh, looking into this in detail. If we needed further um, uh, inducement to study this, it was the discovery of TBK1, which is known to directly phosphorylate and activate optineurin. And TBK1 was discovered to also be a, an ALS-linked gene. So with that as motivation, a brilliant uh, student in my lab at the time, uh, Yvette Wong, set out to ask if optineurin was indeed a receptor that was specifically recruited to damaged mitochondria. And again, optineurin was a good candidate, not just because of its A-linked identification, but because it had a ubiquitin binding domain and an LC3 binding domain. So in the experiment I'm gonna show you what Yvette did 
was specifically damage subsets of mitochondria in the cell by illuminating light on mitochondria that were expressing a construct called mitokiller red. This construct rapidly becomes bleached when we illuminate it, and those mitochondria are then damaged and start secreting reactive oxygen species. What you'll see right now is over time, the, gener the release of the reactive oxygen species and the damage to these mitochondria lead to the depolarization of the membrane and the re specific recruitment of optinurin to those damaged regions. A VEC could show that this was entirely dependent on the uh, presence of active parkin, the E3 ligase that's ubiquitating these uh, mitochondria. We only saw this recruitment of optinurin when we had wild type parkin present and not when we had a uh, Parkinson's disease um, linked mutation that disrupted the E3 ligase activity of parkin. Subsequently, Chantel Evans went on to show a major role for optineurin in neurons specifically. Here you're seeing um, a hippocampal neuron, and you can see the mitochondrial network, um, in, which is beautiful filamentous distribution in yellow. And what you see in pink is regions of this mitochondrial network that have been selectively damaged, in this case by uh, mild um, oxygen damage. So what you see, again, is the very specific uh, recruitment of optineurin, which is shown uh, here in this three-dimensional image, to only the damaged region of the mitochondria. So again, it's very specific damage recognition process that sets off these parts of the mitochondrial network uh, for engulfment by the um, autophagosome and eventual uh, degradation. So uh, where we are right now in the field is we now know that there's a conserved pathway that involves several different receptors. However, of the receptors that have been identified, uh, the field now agrees that in neurons, optineurin and, and its associated kinase TBK1 are the most relevant. And this leads uh, from a damaged mitochondria to the formation of an autophagosome and its eventual clearance by degradation. Further, we know that this pathway is likely to be critical for neuronal health because mutations that are linked to either Parkinson's or ALS both disrupt this pathway. So that's really interesting and it tells us that uh, we and others in this field are likely to be on the right track and we really need to understand this pathway in more detail. But it doesn't tell you why this is so damaging to the neuron. Why do these mutations or any other defects in mitophagy lead to neurodegeneration? So the rest of what I'm gonna tell you about is unpublished, but is uh, available if you're interested. Uh, the preprint is up on BioArchive. So Olivia Harding, a, a graduate student in my lab, set out to ask this question, why do defects in mitophagy lead to neurodegeneration? And to do this, she focused on this growing body of evidence that a release of mitochondrial DNA is damaging to the cell. So the cell is gonna work very hard to avoid any type of inflammatory insult downstream of mitochondrial damage. Uh, the Seagas sting is one of the major pathways known, but the Seagas sting pathway is also expressed at a very low level in neurons. So we were wondering if there might be another type of chronic inflammatory signaling induced by mitochondrial damage or the failure to clear damaged mitochondria. And the reason Liv set off on this uh, quest to find an answer was because she noticed something really interesting. And that's the protein that I've been telling you about, optineurin, which is so critical for the removal of damaged mitochondria from neurons, structurally looks an awful lot like a protein called NEMO. And NEMO is particularly interesting because it's a critical component of a major inflammatory signaling hub called the IKK complex. So, Liv wondered if the similarity between optineurin and NEMO might not just be structural, but might also involve the co-recruitment of NEMO and the activation of IKK signaling in cells with damaged mitochondria. So to set out, to answer that question, she asked the very simple question, 
when you set off the uh, pathway leading to damaged mitochondria and the recruitment of optinurin, are you also recruiting Nemo? So first, what happens in cells that aren't expressing Parkin and are either um, the mitochondria depolarized or not depolarized in control cells? Under these conditions, you see no recruitment of Nemo. However, if those cells are expressing active Parkin, and if the mitochondria are damaged, you see that NEMO is indeed recruited specifically to these damaged mitochondria. And that's quantitated here. She next performed live imaging to compare the recruitment of NEMO to that of optinurin, which we know is a bona fide uh, receptor for damaged mitochondria. As this movie plays, you can see that the mitochondria become damaged. You start to see the network fragment and uh, round up, and you see optinurin recruited to these damaged mitochondria, as I showed you before. But you can also see that, is, that NEMO is also recruited under the same general time scale to these damaged mitochondria, and that's shown here. There's not complete overlap overall. Not every uh, mitochondria that recruits optinurin recruits NEMO, but there's a broad category of overlap. There's also a very similar timing of this, although not exact. Sometimes NEMO gets there first and sometimes optinurin gets there first, but generally about over the same time scale. To understand the, the patterns of recruitment and co-recruitment a little bit better, um, Liz switched to a higher resolution uh, method of imaging these cells and using ARI scan, she directly compared the recruitment of optinurin and NEMO. And what you could see with this higher resolution approach was exactly we, what we saw at our confuncal microscope, that some mitochondria recruited optinurin, some recruited NEMO, and some recruited both. But the and the recruitment patterns were similar, but definitely not the same. However, when Liv went to this higher resolution imaging, what she could clearly see was a very interesting pattern of NEMO uh, recruitment. Um, this may not look familiar to you, but it looked very familiar to us because uh, Vet's work had previously shown that the other receptor in this family, P62, had a very similar pattern when it was recruited to damaged mitochondria. So this kind of very linear uh, localization between clumps of damaged mitochondria. So uh, that was impetus enough for Liv to directly compare P62 and uh, NEMO recruitment. And as you can see here, they are exactly the same. Every place that optinurin, uh, I mean, uh, P62 is, NEMO is. So uh, that led us to do a kinetic experiment where we imaged the re recruitment of P62 and NEMO to damaged mitochondria over time. And that's shown here. And again, what we see is what we saw in the still images that re they're recruited in the same place over the same time. And the uh, variance in the recruitment uh, over time is much less when we compare P62 and NEMO than when we compare optinurin and NEMO. So this was enough to, for us to ask, was it more than that? Was the recruitment of NEMO to damage mitochondria actually dependent on P62? Well, we could do this in a couple of different ways. We can look at either knockdown or knockout cells, and we've done both, but I'll just show you the, the knockdown results. And these results show that under uh, control conditions, when we recruit NEMO, uh, we can recruit NEMO to damage mitochondria, but if we knock down P62, we completely lose this specific recruitment. So we find that the recruitment of NEMO to damage mitochondria is entirely dependent upon P62. Uh, the studies I'm showing you here ask the question, is it possible that uh, the population of mitochondria that recruit NEMO are slower to become engulfed by autophagosomes? Um, the data here are suggestive and we have further data that's uh, preliminary, uh, but is uh, supporting these data to say that the NEMO and P62 population of uh, mitochondria within the cell are slower to be turned over than other mitochondria, especially mitochondria with phosphoopteneurin. 
So we feel that the uh, recruitment of NEMO to mitochondria correlates with the stalling of their clearance from the cell. So that raises the next important question. What are the consequences of persistent NEMO localization? Well, I told you at the beginning of this section that NEMO was a well-characterized component of the IKK uh, complex. And that's a, a, when it forms is a platform for NF-kappa B signaling. So we asked if there was any evidence that other components of this complex were specifically recruited to depolarize mitochondria. And we saw the clear uh, recruitment of another component of this complex and uh, the formation of the active uh, NF-kappa B complex. Downstream of the formation uh, of this complex is induction of uh, uh, activation of the complex and upregulation of NF-kappa B targeting, targeting gene, targeted genes, sorry. Um, and we have evidence by uh, qPCR that simply the, the depolarization of mitochondria in this paradigm is enough to induce upregulation of NF-kappa B target genes, including interleukin-6 and uh, TNF-alpha. So uh, where we are right now is um, an unexpected um, observation that in the very process of trying to clear a damaged mitochondria, you're simultaneously setting off uh, inflammatory pathways in cells. This actually wasn't too much of a surprise because there's been some work suggesting that in cells trying to clear invading bacteria, there's also a similar uh, joint set off of pathways that lead to autophagy of the invading bacteria, but also induction of an inflammatory response. So that if you're not successful in clearing those damaged mitochondria, you have a second uh, form of defense. And uh, I hopefully you're all familiar with the, um, the generally accepted hypothesis that mitochondria are descended uh, evolutionarily from invading bacteria. So we think that there's some um, uh, parallels here that um, in cells with damaged mitochondria, you're simultaneously setting off a pathway to remove the damaged mitochondria through mitophagy, but you're also setting up a pro-inflammatory situation Then, that if you get stalling of this pathway, you may get maintained in a chronic inflammatory state. So there are, of course, many, many questions uh, to answer downstream of this. Um, We'd like to know if ALS-linked genes uh, set off chronic inflammatory signaling upon mitochondrial damage. We'd like to know what cell types are affected, if this is a, a, a cell autonomous in neurons, and we don't think so. We think that glia are involved and are very preliminary data support that. And we'd like to know um, if the initiation and propagation are non-cell autonomous, uh, which we believe and uh, potentially age dependent. So lots more to do, but we think it's really exciting this, uh, this convergence of thought from many different directions that damage to mitochondria could be linked to activation of chronic inflammation, and that could then in turn lead to neurodegeneration. And I'm going to end there just by giving credit to the people that did the work. The first part of my story was uh, performed almost entirely by Juliet Goldsmith, and the second part of my story uh, by Liv Harding. And uh, we're very grateful to our co-workers. Uh, we have a great team both in my lab and more generally on the Mito 911 team. And we're very grateful to our funders. And I'm particularly grateful to you for taking the time to listen today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. That is incredibly fascinating presentation. Very, very grateful. May, may I start uh, by asking a question? Then there are a couple of questions in the chat. So you mentioned that knocking down P62 uh, eliminated the uptake of NEMO. Um, what does the phenotype of an optoneurin uh, knockout look like? Oh, so yes, that's a great question. And we're just talking cells here. We, we haven't moved into yeah. a mouse uh, with the study yep. yet, but in cells, uh, loss of optoneurin has no effect on NEMO. Um, they're not competitive. We were thinking that they might be competitive processes, yeah, yeah. but they seem to be not competitive at all. It definitely, there's room for both on the mitochondria. Um, and this is a P62 dependent process. Thank you. And, and I guess my question is, though, is it possible that mutant optoneurin has other effects besides the failure to activate this pathway? 
yes. So I think this is purely speculative, but uh, we know that uh, some mutations in optineurin can stall out mitophagy. And so our working hypothesis is that you're stalled in this persistent state that can then lead to chronic activation of inflammation. That's what I'd really like to show. Um, and I, I think that that might be generally relevant to both optineurin-dependent ALS and TBK1-dependent ALS, but more broadly to anything that leads to a higher rate, hit rate on mitochondria and, and more mitochondrial damage. Very speculative. Uh, I just wanna emphasize we're at the very beginning of a new mechanism here. Fantastic. We have a couple of questions in the chat. One is, uh, James Gregory says, amazing talk, correctly. Can the inflammatory response be ablated by knockout of NEMO? Yeah, so we haven't tried that because um, <laughs> disrupting the NF-kappa-B pathways uh, seems like a, um, a, a way that's not necessarily going to uh, be practical. So we, we haven't looked at that, but we should try it experimentally, at least in cells in a dish. So I think that's an interesting question. We know mm -hmm. we can ablate it by P62 knockout, but we don't want to recommend that either therapeutically. Do you have any sense of why Parkin variants would cause Parkinson's disease, optoneurin variants, ALS? That's a, re that's a great question. <laughs> um, what I think, and again, this is, I can't, I can't prove this, but what I'm thinking is uh, mutations in pink one and Parkin uh, lead to a failure to initiate this process. So what you wind up is maintaining uh, a, a damaged mitochondria, but not an activation of the uh, ubiquitination of the mitochondria. So what you'll do is you won't remove the damaged mitochondria, but you won't start this pathway that can lead to NEMO uh, recruitment. So I do think that this, uh, this chronic inflammatory signaling is likely to be more relevant to the ALS direction than the uh, Parkinson's direction. Um, we also, um, I, I showed you um, our efforts to uh, isolate autophagosomes from wild type mice. We, we have a, a manuscript we're about to submit where we've done a parallel experiment on um, pink one knockout mice. And what we can show there is that you also, in the absence of pink one, you'll get upregulation of other mitochondrial quality control pathways. And it's possible you don't get those upregulated in optinerin and TBK1 mutants. Alternatively, um, TPK1 has more than one function, not just in the cell, but even in the uh, autophagy pathway. So it could be that you're poking the, the whole process at different stages. So again, a lot more to be done. Thank you. Last question from Glenn Rouse says, do you see an increased rate of mitophagy in ALS and Parkinson's? And if so, does it start slowly and snowball or is it just always higher? I wish I could answer that. And I, I, I hopefully I can, uh, hear from clinicians about the answer to that. I mean, what, what is clear is you see more evidence of, of dysfunctional or a morphologically abnormal mitochondria in ALS. Um, pathologists can tell me, you know, discuss that in, in, in more detail and more accurately than me, but I think the literature is pretty clear on that. Um, yeah, so I think lots more to be done, but... Um, we're excited to keep doing it. It's really been an interesting study so far. Thank you so much. So uh, moving ahead, it's a uh, privilege for me and for actually for all of us to have uh, Kevin